Welcome to The Growing Band Director, the podcast that dives into topics applying to all of us band directors. My name is Kyle Smith, and joining me is my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. Together, we discuss many aspects of a school band program, including how to build your concert, jazz, and marching programs, as well as everything else we do as band directors. More importantly, we'll discuss concepts that help us all improve our own programs every day. Always remember the famous quote by Ray Kroc, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're ripe, you rot. Let's get started. All right, everybody, nice to see you for episode 13. This one, is we're discussing the longevity of our band programs. And there's so many of our programs that, you know, our flash is in the pan, or we have one group that's great, and then not great, and then... You know, we're known for something and then programs disappear for a couple years and then come back and and all this. And but then there's those programs that are just consistent throughout the years and throughout the decades. And even sometimes when there's directors that change, sometimes those programs continue to be solid and strong programs. And what is it about those programs that that allows them to be long lasting and um, not waver up and down and um, continue to have continued success? So that's what we're discussing today. Good morning, Jeff. How are you? Good morning. How are you, Kyle? Very good. So I think this this um, topic is a passion of both of ours. Um, we really are subtitling this the Balanced Band Program. And when we talk about balance, um, we're mainly speaking of how, like, what is important in our programs, what do we focus the program on, and then what is outside of that that is also good. Um, in my in my view, I feel like the reason a lot of band programs and band directors put put different programs as important in front of what really should be important is the chase for awards, the chase for trophies, uh, and the chase for recognition. Um, so, Jeff, where do we want to start on all this? Well, I think the first thing a band director needs to do is have a vision of what they want their program to look like in five years, 10 years, 15 years, et cetera. And uh, what do they draw upon for examples? For myself, I, I drew upon a lot of different things. For jazz, I always looked at Hall High School in West Hartford. For contraband and marching band, I always looked at Plymouth Canton High School in Ohio, Lasseter High School in Georgia, and Carmel High School in Indiana. And for small ensembles, I looked at this little high school in Upper Connecticut directed by Bruce Schmottlack. There were 250 kids in the high school. There were 195 kids in band. He had small ensembles all over the place. He had tons of kids in all state, tons of kids playing all over the place. And I thought that was just phenomenal. And uh, so I think you have to have a vision and you have to decide what you want. And do you start from the top down? And what is the top, elementary or high school? Or do you stop from the bottom up? Once again, which is elementary or high school? And I think a good program has to be one that feeds itself. And I think that's where people have to look at how is the overall program constructed so it can lead to that balanced program? Well, let's let's start at the high school level and work our way backward. Um, right. so what do you think is the foundation of the entire high school band program? The foundation of the entire high school program must be the concert band program, whether you call it wind ensemble, wind symphony, what have you. And I believe that within that has to be the focus of the development of the individual students through the concert band program. So I, I was listening to a podcast recently and they were talking about how the, the curriculum of your program is not the music that you're playing at concerts and it's not even the book that you use, but the, the core curriculum is actually what do you need each instrument to know? What do you need each kid to learn? So take, for example, a clarinet player. Could you write down for your program, what do you want your, your clarinet players to be able to do, right? What skills should they be able to do uh, and have? And then how are you going to get them there through supplemental techniques or through books? Um, but ideally, having them learn it actually outside of the band repertoire and then using it in the band repertoire. Um, so I, I would I would urge people to think about that, you know, like 
it go through every instrument and write down what do you want them to be able to do? What do you want them to know? Um, and then it's your job to, to devise ways and curriculum for them to be able to do that, whether that be handouts or, or, or method books. Well, that's what my district did. We, um, we devised it based on instrument, based on grade level and based on performance level. But the example we used was from the West Hartford Public Schools where they have such a concise curriculum of the expectations of every student from grade 12 through grade four to the point where it, it, it's almost a weekly curriculum of where they expect the students to be. A little too constrictive in my opinion because every child doesn't develop at the same rate of speed, but it did give the teachers a very clear guide of where to go and how to get the kids to there. And we can't dispute the fact of them having put out very fine musicians over the years. But also, I think we have to make it so that kids are lifelong learners of music, that they want to keep being involved in music, whether as a performer, as a listener, or as a patron, what have you. So an example of that, if you think about, I'll take my program, for example, and when, when we're talking about key signatures, um, I'm a firm believer that all my students should be able to play in every key. And I try to come as close as I can to having every kid play in every key every single day or at least every single day that we're playing. Every key, every day. I stole that from John Cooper at College of the Atlantic. And even if it's just the first note of the scale every day. Um, so in my concert band, we go through this extensive process to be able to get them to play all of their major scales within their freshman year. Now, like most of us, our students come in from middle school knowing anywhere from one to maybe five, four scales. An average of two or three scales is what, what they can usually get to. And then our job is to build all the other scales throughout their freshman year. Now, I don't know if anybody's heard this in past podcasts, but I use a grid system where we talk about note names rather than what it looks like on the paper first. And we'll go just the first note of the scale for each one of them. So we'd go C and then F and then B flat and then E flat. And we'd go all the way down the circle of fifths. And then once the kids are comfortable doing that, then we add the second note of the scale of all 12. And then the third note of the scale of all 12. And then eventually you know, it quickly compounds itself and um, exponentially moves quicker. And then by the end of the year, they can play all the scales because they're used to it. And once they have the pattern of what that scale feels like, then once they start seeing it on the paper, we do it with accidentals. So they can see the note name written over it and what it looks like. And then they see it later in the line with just the key signature. So, but it's it's almost teaching scales by rote like we do in in the English language, right? We learn how to speak and then we learn how to read it. So I would much rather my kids know the key of E flat major on the trumpet and then see the three flats and be able to play it. Um, then when, our, so if our students leave there, that's one of sort of our prerequisites to going into our top group. And then when they're in our top group, obviously we go back and we, we review a lot and we'll work on technique more in building them within that. And usually in that, in that group, that's when we'll start talking about the minor side of each one of those keys as well. Um, but that's sort of a small example of what we do on the key signature side. And I urge everybody to have a plan like that for everything that they do so that they have, when they get to their top group or their students are at the higher level, they have all this fundamental knowledge that you've instilled in them on purpose through the concert band program. Again, like you said, whether it be symphonic band or concert band or band or freshman band or wind ensemble or wind symphony or whatever. We did a similar thing. Yeah. Uh, our midterm exam was on the uh, up to four flats and four sharps in the freshman year. And then by the end of the freshman year, it was all flats, all sharps. Yeah. And uh, we kept reinforcing it every rehearsal. We had a warm ups that we used every day that went through all the major scales. We could do our entire warm up with lip slurs, uh, tonguing articulation studies and scales, get it all done in five minutes and uh, review it constantly. And every midterm, every final had them playing those scales and writing those scales. I, I didn't feel it was just suitable for them to just play it. They needed to be able to write it as well. I've definitely um, struggled with that. I When I've tried to do theory, like written theory in the past, I have a hard time just dabbling with it. Um, so I've struggled with that. But I also, in midterms, um, this is an idea that I've used. I made, I took these little like six inch by six inch pieces of plywood and then made a little spinner out of it with a screw in the middle. And then as you go around, it's the chromatic scale or whatever, and there's an arrow on both sides of the stick. So then when the kid comes in for their midterm and they spin it, they always will get the tritone away. So if one side focuses on C, the other one is on F sharp, 
if one's on G, the other one's on D flat, and so on and so forth. Um, and then when they come in, those are the two scales that they have to play. So it's an element of chance, and it's a fun way to do it. We did it similar to you. We had three buckets. We had a bucket of sharp scales, a bucket of flatted scales, and then a bucket of scales. And a kid had to pick one, put their hand in and pick one out of each bucket. And it always worked out that they covered what I wanted to get covered. And um, we tested regularly on scales as as we, was, uh, we had to have some testing formats within the assessment formats within the district. And that's what we used and we worked on scales. But I think another thing that band directors, you planned out that real well. The other thing we planned out was rhythm, rhythmic understanding. Mm -hmm. We had in every piece, we had a specific rhythm that we were trying to highlight to make sure that the kids knew. And, um, you know, I find that a lot of high school kids sort of understand compound time, but don't understand it well enough. And we started right from freshman year working on compound time. And we, we created a book so that we could work on that within the confines of band rehearsal and lessons. And uh, we wrote it ourselves, a group of us from the district. And um, it was based on uh, Charles, Charles Collins book rhythms for jazz, but we made it classical and jazz too. And uh, we focused very heavily on rhythm. So if you had come into a classroom and you were the band director being assessed, the uh, assessor could say, well, what are you working on today? We're working on this key, this key. We're working on these three rhythmical concepts and we're working on these dynamic concepts and these articulative concepts and showing the difference how in this song, articulation is gonna be done this way, but in this song from a different period, it's gonna be done this way. And from a different period, this articulation is gonna be this way. And it's, since you're talking about rhythm, uh, I'm gonna put in the PDF and the link to the show notes. A uh, shout out to the Summit Intermediate School Bands. I actually don't have any connection with them at all. Um, and there's a great rhythm drills book written by Jonathan Pesky. Um, so if you listen to this, uh, shout out to you guys. Um, but uh, this will be on the link as well if anybody who wants to download it and use it. Uh, it's called Rhythm Drills. And the, what I've been doing with our, our bands, especially since you know, we had all this time on remote band and all that, you know, coming back to brand new, we're definitely going backwards, right? And, and trying to build the skills wherever the kids are at. So we'll take you know, two or three lines a, a day and on these rhythm drills and we'll do it three times through we'll we'll count the rhythm the first time you know and these are it's a it's a great rhythm, little rhythm book they put together because it you know it's very sequential it moves from super easy to more complicated and each page is pretty concise you can tell it was written for the grade two level because it doesn't get super in-depth it really just like hits it a few times and then moves on um and so we'll count it the first time whisper count it the second time and um, play it the third time on a static pitch. We have not gotten to a point where we actually change notes within it, but I've noticed the students' sight reading has gotten so much better because every day we just spend 30 seconds with this rhythm drills. And there's, now that they're used to the, the, um, uh, what is it, the logical order of how we're doing it, um, it's so impressive that it's improved. So shout out to that group and that, that teacher, and that will be on the links for this if anybody wants to download that. And speaking to sight reading, what, what we did is we spent a lot of time teaching the, our counting method of count, counting rhythms. And every time we sight read a piece, we did it as we were, because we went to a lot of different adjudication festivals. There was always a sight reading component. So we would take a piece and my kids would say their piece with the rhythms and the repeats and the dynamics yeah. through the entire piece. So that when we got to sight reading, you'd get five minutes to look at a piece. We'd have five minutes and we'd say, okay, everybody look at it, any questions? And then we'd go and the one and a two and three, four and a one and a two, and then they'd count, count it through that way. Count, they wouldn't sing it, but they, they would talk about it. We'd talk about the key signatures, changes, key signatures, accidentals, all that. And uh, we'd get through a piece and it made it so that when we came to play the piece for, for the assessment or anytime we learned a piece, it automatically turned out that we had played it once even though we never touched our instruments on it. And uh, the drummers would just count the rhythms. And if they had a roll, they go and go to roll tongue and stuff like that. And it, it made sight reading so much easier. And because of our strict format of sticking to rhythms, it, it worked out well for us. That's great. But I sight reading is another component that I think every band director needs to have part of their program. Because let's face it, in the end, we hope to have kids that are going to leave our program and go to other places, whether it be collegiate or community bands or what have you. And they're going to be able to sit down and play a relatively 
difficult piece of music with a certain amount of accuracy. I was listening to to um, a speaker talk, and they were talking about when you're doing a sight reading, teaching the, the children to look through the piece for a note inventory, which is basically just when you look from the beginning and look through every single note and make sure and try to find any notes that you don't know. Is there a note that you've never seen before? Um, and this could be applied to any other things as well, but just having them look past the first line and actually look all the way through and then have a chance to ask questions or ask or ask their peers, um, oh, what is the name of this note? I forget that fingering, look it up. Just be studious about it um, gives them better chance when they're actually sight reading. Agreed. I, I think the biggest mistake people use having judged adjudications with sight reading is that they just said, well, look at the piece and then if you have any questions, ask me. But there's no system of looking at the piece. And I think as educators, we need to give our students a system to look at the piece so they understand. But once again, the, the center of the program has to be your concert band. And I, I, I found with that sight reading, my students now would, when I started doing that a number of years ago, my students would learn the music so much quicker, right? Yeah. And, and as you're able to learn stuff quicker, I was a proponent for actually doing a performance every, every six weeks. And so we we do many performances throughout the year, and kids would always be ready for the concert, whether it's three months away or three days away. The music suddenly gets ready right before the concert, so that helped us do so much more. Um, so you know we don't get many awards for concert band. I mean you can go to concert band festivals, but we know that concert band, wind ensemble, whatever you want to call it, is the basis for where you're going to teach all the students the things. Uh, one quick note about awards. Was, I was in another school once and I saw this great quote on the wall that said, the only thing you need to know about trophies is that Mozart never won one. And I thought that was funny. It's like, you know, trophies make us feel good. And I know there's this whole um, side of competitive music that is good. And then all there's all these other people also who feel like there is, you know, competitive music is bad and should never exist. Um, you know, and I think we're you, Jeff, you and I are both somewhere in the middle about how we think there's a value to it. Um, but it's really easy to see why people get sucked into doing marching band as the most important thing in their program or jazz ensemble or winter guard or winter percussion as the leader of their program because when that, it, when that um, is successful, they bring home awards and trophies and that gets people excited. The problem is that it's harder to keep that longevity going, right? Um, when we had the pandemic and actually we had a fire in the, in the building last fall, or last when last um, summer. So when we came back in the fall this year, we were not in school. We didn't have band class. We were remote with half of our classes, and then we pushed the band classes to in person second semester. Um, but what that what that did was we then had marching band where we'd show up, and the kids literally had not played since the last marching band rehearsal, and we couldn't even go in the building, right? And it was just it's this huge impact of not having concert band. I was like. If we couldn't, if this was an all the time thing, I mean, we'd be done in two years. You just can't, you can't build those skills. So Jeff, I know it's a passion of yours. You, you know about a lot of programs that especially put marching band before everything else. And could you speak to the, the pluses of that? And then like the, the real downsides of what that approach brings? Well, I think the, the biggest problem when marching beco band becomes your end all, you're not really, well, let me back up a bit. A lot of times when programs do that, it's because the band director has a staff and they tend to start rehearsal. They'll go to their office and let the staff run rehearsal. And then they'll come back near the end of rehearsal and throw a few words out. And, and that's, that's their total participation. In deference for you and for me as band directors, we're totally immersed in what we do. But the problem is that marching band has so many other components besides music that you have to worry about that getting the kids to be great players is sometimes takes a back seat because you're so worried about are they on their dot are they doing the right body etc cetera, etc cetera. and if you don't have a large staff well that's even a bigger problem and for me when I first started doing marching band I was the staff so I had to teach the guard I had to teach the drum line I had to teach the horns uh, but fortunately, I had contraband to fall back on to do the basic teaching so I could just talk about it on the field. And, and just imagine Programs just imagine if you started a jazz band or a marching band and literally every kid in there was an Allstate player. Right. How easy would your group be? So getting those kids levels up will improve that whole program. Sorry to interrupt. Keep going. Well, the, the other thing about what you just said is an interesting point is that, 
Yeah, but they're only with you for four years. Mm -hmm. So what keeps the program building? A marching band's not a keep, it's an attractor. It creates a spree de corps, but it doesn't keep the program going forever. So we've got programs that have good marching bands or great marching bands, great or good winter percussion groups, great or good winter guard groups. And now because of WGI, winter wins they have going. But let's be honest. Each of those groups is losing, learning seven to 10 minutes worth of music, mm -hmm. going over the same thing every day. Are we teaching them to be readers? No, we're not. We're teaching them to be memorizers, which yep. there's an advantage to that, but we're not teaching them to be learners of music because probably when they go into each one of those groups, it's either being taught by road or it's just being pounded into their head till they learn it. Whereas they pick up a piece of music like your kids or like my kids, and they'd go home and they'd read it and learn to play it. And then they'd come back and we talk about how to put it together in an appropriate musical fashion, whether it be marching. But I, I think that if you look at the great, great programs, if you look at Lasseter High School, if you look at Carmel High School, if you look at Plymouth, Plymouth Canton High School, if you look at L.D. Bell, you may read about them, all the great accolades in marching band, winter percussion, winter guard, uh, et cetera, jazz band. But if you go back and look at their websites, the concert band is the primary focus. There's this concert band concert. This, during marching season, there's concert band concerts. During the entire year, like you said, every six weeks. We did it on every seven to eight weeks because of the way our schedule fell. But we did a lot of concerts. My groups with marching band, jazz, and concert band, and small ensembles, we did up to 85 to 90 concerts a year. Because we felt that, how does a kid learn to play an instrument? Playing it not sitting in a closet and practicing the same thing over and over again, need an abundance of repertoire and abundance of learning different things. And, and I'd uh, rather do, I'd rather do, you know, eight concerts where they do three pieces each with 24 pieces rather than three concerts of five and you have 15, 15 pieces, right? So there's just so much right. you can get to. Yeah. And let's look at the attention span of children. You know, you, <laughs> when you do it every six to eight weeks, you know, you're focused and the kids are staying focused because they know when that sixth week comes or eighth week comes, they're going on to something new. It's not a re repetition of something over again. Yeah. And the wealth of learning different repertoire far exceeds the repetition of doing the same thing over and over again. Though there's merit and wealth in, worth in doing that, but what are we charged with? Are we charged with just winning a trophy or putting out one thing? Well, some people think that, but we as music educators want to see kids grow and develop into lasting musicians that they can do this over and over again. I, and I, go ahead. Sorry. No, that's great. For the, for the band directors who have never done this before, right? And they have a concert every three months. And I've talked to them and a lot of them say, well, but we need the time to start working on other stuff that's not music. Like, well, for those three months, for the first month, we're going to work on like our scales and our technique and all that. And it's like, okay, well, that's not that's not how we want to do it. So my suggestion for those people is try to program, like for next year, try to program like a November concert, like early November, maybe late October, depending on your schedule. Um, try to program something for December. Try to program something for maybe February and then April, right? So, something like that and maybe late May. And then say, okay, what music could I get them to play in six weeks? Right. And maybe if you're used to playing grade three, maybe that means that next year you do a lot of grade twos and one three. And but what that allow you to do is it's like less pressure, but more pressure at the same time. The, it's more pressure because there's more to do quickly. But when you get the kids on board with that and they're playing easier music, you'll find you can teach all the techniques every day and the music. And it just continues to go and go and go and go. So that's, and that's a practical the, way to do it. And incorporate the scales and the rhythms into that daily teaching, but not make it be the one singular focal point. The, the one thing about kids is they don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again for an hour. You've got to figure out ways of teaching all these things to become very connected, but fragmented so that you're getting all the points across and keeping their attention because you're shifting to something different all the time. I, I, I remember an administrator coming into one of my classes and sitting there for the entire time, which was quite rare. And, uh, do, and said, you know, uh, well, we had evaluation. He said, no, I just came to watch you teach. And I said, well, why? He said, because in that 47 minutes that you had, 
he la laid off 10 things that I did. But as an older teacher, I didn't think about the 10 things. It was just the 10 things that that's the way I do things. He yep. said, most teachers will worry about two or three concepts. And first of all, you weren't worried about it. You just did it. Yep. And, and that's what all of us need to learn to do is to do it and make it just part of our personal vocabulary when teaching. Because, we, you know, we lead the kids. So the kids, the kids will only know what we do. So if this is a shift change for some people, then at first it'll be new to the kids. But after that, it won't. Um, I urge people to, you know, when they have free time, when they're not actually planning for a specific concert, to create a list of pieces that fit certain categories. For examples, like how many cut time pieces can you write down that is of the right level for your kids to, to play? Um, how many 6-8 pieces? We're doing one right now called Castle Bay and one called Dream Song, which are both great grade 2 6-8 pieces. Um, what about 5-4 pieces or, or other mixed meter pieces? like um things like that how many keys can you how many pieces can you find that are in a key that stretches them just a little bit you know it's hard to find a, a grade two piece or grade three piece in the key of e like it's just not going to happen thankfully but you know can you find that piece that's in a flat major how many a flat major pieces can you find how many concert c pieces can you find to stretch that a little bit so that when you're planning your program and you might say okay on i want to do six concerts and I want to do every other concert, I want to do one that's going to have like a stretching key signature for them. Um, and then every every concert, I want to do something that's in 6-8, right? So if you sort of have a plan and you think of the long-term vision of the year, then you know you can teach those within the, the, the music. And let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. When you are a graduating student from UNH in your undergraduate years, your, yep. your, your undergraduate did you have this wealth of knowledge at that time? Negative. And then you went on and got your degree, master's in conducting, where I know Andy just deluged with material, but still there was more things. And I think the thing that we have to impress upon our younger band director friends, we've all been there, but there's a great series of books teaching music through performance. Mm -hmm. And the, the way that that, the way that book works is every year, Eugene Corporan, and it used to be Dennis Fisher. I, I forget the name of the of the new person who's there at UNT, University of North Texas. They do this 12-day collegium where you can go and conduct, and you can go and be there, and you can conduct their wind symphony, which is made up of some other people because it's summertime. Um, and then they, when everybody leaves after the 12 days, they sit down and do a recording session of all these great grade two, three pieces, and then they release a DVD. And I think that is still an ongoing thing. I have not checked this year, but that's a, I've done that. And that's where I met Alan McMurray and Dennis Fisher and, and all those yep. people. And um, so that series is wonderful. And that's, that's how that comes about. And then out of New England Conservatory, there's, this is back from the eighties, but there's four books that are about band repertoire, specifically band, not orchestral transcriptions that do the same thing. And those books were my Bible when, when I'm saying, okay, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I want something that's different. So I'd go sit there and just research, and then you'd have the CD, throw it in the machine, listen to it and say, yeah, and then you get a perusal score and say, yep, that's what I'm going to teach. Mm -hmm. And uh, then comes the comment from some of our younger band directors, well, I don't have time to do this during the school year, right? That's what you, that's what you have to do on your breaks in the summer is do this research and just keep meticulous notes on what you want to do and slowly develop a good library. And you may inherit a school district that doesn't have a good band library. Well, there are some things that are in public domain that you can download. And the other thing is talk to your colleagues, borrow music, trade music uh, to try to help out. And then within your budget, maybe get a consortium going with like five or six area band directors and come up with a, com a community, community library and say, okay, guys, I'll buy this this year. You buy this this year. You buy that this year. And then we'll rotate it around so we all get to use it and share it till we can get our libraries up to where we think they should be. I, I was fortunate. I worked in a school district that had, I worked at first one high school in town and then the other high school in town. And we had enormous libraries that were created by guys that were from uh, the Midwest that was at that time the, the king of a concert band. And I had a great 
contraband library and a fan fabulous jazz ensemble library. I, I, I agree. That, uh, I was in a similar position. There's great music in our library when I got here. Um, most of it too hard for the students that were there then. So the issue I had over the next 10 years was buying the music that was newer, that was ready for our kids. Like we weren't playing Variations on America by Charles Ives or the Hindemith Symphony. I mean, I have it. It's right over here. I could find it for you, but you know, it's, we're not going to play it. Um, so yeah, that building of the library is really important. I just looked on Pepper under 5-4 and uh, there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things. So even now, just your research can be so much easier, easy done. You know, you could put in 6-8 in concert band and find just a thousand things. Um, and, you know, everybody, a shout out to Jean Quinn. She uh, teaches now at University of Southern Maine as a, in a methods course, I believe, and just retired as a band director, a longtime band director, and one of our good uh, one of the good friends of my wife and I, her and her husband, Rusty. Um, and I was looking for some some music recently, and I said, you know what? I'm a high school teacher, but I want to ask a middle school teacher who has done this a really long time, can you give me some pieces that really work for da 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 I forget if it was, I think it was 6-8, but I don't remember. And she just sent back to me like seven pieces I had never heard of. And I ended up using one of them, but now there's all these pieces that I know of that are great. So I've 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 made it a point this year especially to reach out to Caitlin Ramsey at uh, Cape Elizabeth High School, uh, Middle School. And obviously my wife, we talk all the time, but like the literature with people who are even within other grade levels, because um, I'm a high school teacher, but I love doing middle school band music. I just think it's great. Just like sometimes middle schools can do a high school piece, depending on how it fits them. High school pieces can, high school bands can do middle school bands uh, music and it, it works really, really well. So ask and, another and, for help. And if I could add in also, you know, I was very active in the, in the Connecticut Music Educators Association. And when we'd be at regional festivals, high school festivals, or adjudication festivals, and there was nothing going on that we could participate, we as band directors would sit around and with coffee and donuts, and we'd sit there and we'd talk about repertoire and what everybody's doing. And somebody say, well, what are you doing new this year? And they'd say the name of the piece and they talk about it a little bit. And I did that for 35 years. And I can't tell you the wealth of information that I learned from my colleagues about different pieces to use. And it wouldn't be just the band, high school band director's room. It would be the middle school and some of the elementary school band directors. And we'd talk about all encompassing literature that would help the kids. And that helped us all get our contraband programs going. And then we'd always talk about marching band and jazz band. And you know, we had some friends that were just totally focused on marching band and the marching arts. And we'd always say, well, how have you done this piece? And no, no, no. And I said, well, maybe it'd be time to look at that. But then we also had the groups that were just totally focused on jazz band. And we they'd have good jazz groups. But the problem was that it didn't service the multitude of kids that they could service. Okay. Now, my program in particular had three jazz ensembles at three different levels. And we did a lot. We did the Clark Terry. We did the uh, NAJE. We did the Berkeley and all that stuff. And we did lots of performances in town covering lots of repertoire. And uh, that was what we thought. But it wasn't the focal point of the program. Mm -hmm. The focal point of the program was the concert band. And from that concert band came the jazz. So then comes the problem. And that is, we made a rule that for you to be in any group within the instrumental music program of our town, you had to be a member of the concert band program, with the exception of the jazz piano player, the bass player and the guitar player because we didn't want kids to start specializing in high school. It's too soon. Yeah. And you know, I, I have colleagues who have said, well, I, I specialize and my kids specialize in jazz and they're going out and play jazz. Okay. So when they, if they decide to continue to play and you ask them to play Haydn trumpet concerto, how are they going to do? And well, if, if you ever ask an athlete, you know, I guess this is, might be a bad comparison, but people who are just into general fitness, they don't just play tennis, right? They don't just play football. They, they don't just run. They don't just lift weights. They try to do all of it. Now they have specific areas of focus. Now, you know, when you get to a certain level, if you want to be Kobe Bryant, then yes, you're in the gym, you know, 10 hours a day, just doing basketball, right. Um, and lifting weights on top of that. But you're right. It's too, it's definitely too young. Right. And, and I think the other thing that's important is to get kids to experience small ensembles mm -hmm. where they learn that there isn't another person of their like instrument sitting next to them playing, but 
they're playing with uh, if, like a woodwind quintet. They're playing with the oboe player, the flute player, the French horn player, the bassoon player, the clarinet player. And it's their responsibility to have their part learned and know the other people's parts. And they learn much more about playing, about one another, about intonation, blend, balance, etc. Same thing in with percussion. In a practical sense, as somebody who's had to do this a lot, the, the, here's two things that help me a lot. One, there's uh, I, I the first time I do this, I always let kids go in groups of two, three or four with their best friends. I just look because I want them to look forward to doing it. Now, sometimes they're a little less productive, a little bit, but these kids in a room without you as it is, they're going to be a little bit less productive. So if they're if their goal is to be able to play this piece with their friends and they're one on a part, to me, it's a win. Um, and then from there, you could slowly ramp up the OK, who goes with what and all that. A trick one time, I had a trumpet quartet that was kind of like, eh, they were like not interested in doing it, but they were doing it and they were playing a lyrical piece. And there was all these things that they couldn't do well, but they thought it was easy and they were done. To motivate them, I gave all four of them flugelhorns and you would have thought they were in the Portland Symphony. Like, oh my gosh, I get to play a flugelhorn and they thought it was the coolest thing ever. So sometimes like a little tweak to it can get it to be really exciting. Um, and then secondly, literature I assume people are aware of this now. You know, when I started teaching about 20 years ago, it was all, you know, Canadian brass books and the Voxman books and all these things that were very instrument specific and amazing literature. Those still exist and should be used. But in most band programs, if you take trios for all, quartets for all, um, and there's uh, the, the there's every publisher has these you know, flexible instrumentations where it's two parts, three parts, and you can just, and you know, one year I spent like $900 on just like chamber books. Cause I'm like, you know what, for next year, I, I've chosen what I want to do. We have enough music here. I'm not going to buy anything this year. My, I'm going to invest in the chamber books. And now I have, you know, three feet tall worth of all this chamber music that kids can choose from, from classical to jazz, to um, pop music, to Broadway music, to everything. Um, so the famous ones that I've used the most are trios for all and quartets for all. Um, mm -hmm. I forget the publisher on that, but every publisher has them and they're front and center every time you go to a display booth uh, and online. Um, and that's a really great way to get them into chamber music. Um, I know I'm talking a lot here, but one of my one of my good friends, Al Yezway, who passed away, uh, ooh, uh, 11 years ago now, was a chief judge at, at Maine Band Directors Association and passed away pretty suddenly. Um, he always insisted that the chamber ensembles were really the center of the whole program that the concert band was, but even within there, the chamber ensembles, because when the kids are playing one on a part, that's really the most important thing. And I think at the middle school level, uh, and even the elementary school level sometimes, if you can, if you can write music that's simple enough, that at that level, they can do it. Like having sixth graders, four kids, and they're all playing a different part. Like, I don't care how easy it is. That's an amazing skill to do. And even if it's not the level you want it to be, or the music is super, super, super simple. I mean, start with playing, a, you know, their six note scale, but in a round. So they're all p responsible for their own part. You know, something simple like that where from a young, young age, they're, they're involved in chamber music um, the, to the best of your ability at least once a year. And that just, you know, that gives every kid the reason to be like, no, I can't hide. I do have to play out. I have to, do, have to be able to cover my part. And then when you come into concert band, it's like, yeah, every kid's going to be able to know what it's like to cover their own part. In theory, that's supposed to work. When I taught middle school, we, we started band in middle school at the district I taught in. And uh, we did a concert we started the kids in the fall and we did a concert in early November of all the beginners. And for every lesson group, we wrote small ensemble performances. So mommy and daddy could come to the concert after the kid playing what September, October, two and a half months. And they're playing something in a small ensemble in front of the audience. And then we took one piece, which was grade minus a half and we all played it and we had readily admitted it wasn't perfect but it showed what they could be and then at the end of that concert and what you're teaching older you're kids come in and play one piece you're teaching the parents what all the different instruments sound like so then when they hear them together then they start understanding more too. right and that's the other part of being having a balanced program is you're not just teaching the children you're teaching the parents to become your ambassadors into the community 
And then with that same chamber music concept in their first year of playing, we did the one in November, and then we did another one in May. So the parents could see the growth. And if things were going real well that year, we'd do one in February so the parents could see and watch their kids. And what we did is every one of those concerts, we had refreshments before the concert and we had refreshments at the end of the concert so parents could sit and just stand around and talk and talk about their kids. And we as music staff would go and talk to the parents and everything to show them how this all fits together and just give them a glimmer of the big picture. There are... Unfortunately, sometimes, oh, there's, so the program that I'm in, when I first got here, that was actually a struggle that we had, was they had had the food, not before and after, but also during throughout the entire concert. Oh. You had parents selling hot dogs instead of listening. You had people leaving to get a hot dog and coming in, like in the middle of pieces. And when, when we were pretty adamant about this is something we don't want to do. If you want to do it afterward or before, that's one thing. And then pretty soon it just, it kind of went away. I said, no, you know, you, you support the kids all year long. You don't have to sell hot dogs on the concert. Why don't you just come and sit and watch your kid perform? And then it's, and it's going to be done. And they're like, yeah, but we're going to make another $50. It's like, yeah, but how about you just enjoy what your kids are doing? Yeah. We, so we never dangerous. sold anything. We just had the coffee, tea, milk, uh, juice, whatever. Yep. Uh, donuts and pastries and then we'd and we put it right up against the stage in the front and then when it was time to start we said okay we're done with food now and then we talked music for 45 minutes maybe tops and then at the end i said now you're welcome to come on up and then and we brought the kids down and the kids had some treats and the kids and parents just mulled together but yeah you're right and not everything as a band director has to be a fundraiser yeah, I, I wrote something down that I want to just circle back to um, when we're talking about to with other directors about great repertoire. I want everybody to just think right now of one band director that they admire in their area, somebody they're friends with that they that they think they have a good program and they respect that person. And then a simple thing you can do rather than getting together, because that's that's really hard a lot of times is just send that person a message and just say, hey, can you tell me what are some of your favorite pieces right now? Right. And if and and I'll bet you there's going to be pieces there that you really have never heard of. And just write those down and listen to them. Try to picture your kids with those pieces. And then if you get one out of it, then it's worth it. And and then maybe suggest them, hey, here are like five or six of my favorites right now. Um, and, and if you like doing that, pick another friend. If you're a band director and happen to have two friends, then pick somebody else and send the same message or make a group chat and be like, hey, guys, I want to start talking band rep. Whenever we think about a piece, just throw it on here so we can all learn about it, right? And that in our new modern age of technology is a way to do that uh, as well. Um, and a shout out to 5-4. I know we talked about Ruckus by Randall Standridge the other day. That That's a, a very cool piece. Um, the old stand, and I don't mean old, old, because I'm going to make you feel bad here, Jeff, but the standard 5-4 <laughs> <laughs> the standard 5-4 piece for so many years was Cajun Folk Songs by Frank DeKelly, which is a great piece of music, and I've done it before. But but the issue is, again, there's not a lot of percussion in there. So I have not been able to do it in a long time because it, there just isn't enough for the kids to play. If I could choose how many kids were in the group and then select it, then I would do it over and over again. There is a new piece that I fell in love with about eight or nine years ago and this is classic about listening to groups outside of your ability level above and below i was at midwest and listened to michigan state and i believe it was kevin kevin senatal who was the, the the conductor and i was just listening and they did two pieces on this feature concert at midwest that i that i thought we could actually do at one point and one of them was this beautiful um five four piece entitled charm if, if anybody's never heard of the piece charm by kevin putz it's just amazing. There's plenty of percussion writing, and except for four squirrely measures, it's really one of the best teaching pieces I've ever taught, I've ever had the chance to do with audience engagement as well, and it's in 5-4. Um, I've done some other 5-4 pieces that tend to get a little, a little on the cheesy side, but that's definitely a really great concert work for anybody who's looking at the grade. I guess it would be an easy grade four um, piece. So you know, heart, Ruckus is definitely a little bit easier than that. And there are other, are other great 5-4 pieces. But I wanted to make sure I um, I mentioned that one because Charm is just a great piece. Yeah, and I, I think just sharing pieces like Blue and the Green Music, Sam Hazo. Blue and Green Music, yep. It's a great piece. I'm doing it with my community, the community band that I teach. 
because we're doing a, a concert based on art and the relationship of art to music. Uh, art in the Park, another Sheldon. great piece by um, Sheldon. Oh, Sheldon, yeah, Bob yep. Sheldon. And, um, you know, there, there's tons of stuff out there. And uh, those, the Art in the Park might be a little high, high end, but, you know, yep. it is what it is. But, you know, I, I think on the, on the balanced band, if you have your concert band as your primary focal point and think of it as a wheel, and from that wheel comes small ensembles, solos, lessons. We got to talk for a second about lessons if we get a chance. Yep. Jazz ensemble, marching band, winter guard, winter percussion. But without the concert band, you have nothing. Because and many, that's times, what... many times staff members say, well, why can't this be a bigger deal? Why, why do you want to make this whatever activity? Like, why do you want to kind of keep it in its place? Because we can flourish and it can do so much more. It's like, yes, but if at any point any of those comes in front of the learning and the teaching for the kids and for you, then it's only a matter of time until the program is going to spiral down. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example without mentioning names. In, in where I came from, there was this school district. They had a phenomenal concert band. And then they started doing Winter Guard. And then the Winter Guard caught on. And then they had an elementary Winter Guard, a middle school Winter Guard, and two high school Winter Guards. And a lot of the kids in the Winter Guard were also instrumentalists. So as we watched the Winter Guard program increase and increase and increase, we also saw at the same time that the concert band program was decreasing and decreasing and decreasing because on the high school level, the parents found out, well, my kid can do winter guard after school hours and travel all these places and get all these trophies and take another academic course during the day. And that's where I think as band directors, we have to sell our program that that during the day program, that course that's is it. why you have those programs, right? Not the opposite of that. And we have to be careful of that. Same thing, I think that happens all the time with marching band and all the time with jazz band. Um, I know in Connecticut, there's, from when I was in, I, I taught in Connecticut for 40 years and uh, 35 in the public schools. And I watched concert pram, uh, marching band programs get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden, band directors decided, I don't want to do that anymore. So the number of marching bands diminished it's like you and i have talked about how one time in maine there were so many marching bands you didn't know what where to turn and they diminished to a a decent number and they just stopped doing marching band totally well i think that's a mistake too i i think there needs to be a balance because you're going to find kids that from the marching side do concert band you got some kids who do jazz band but because they want to be in jazz band they do concert band they want to do winter percussion, but they do concert band. And if you use that as your focal point, as your hub, you can have everything and still have that wonderful concert band program. Because if they want to do any of those things, they have to be able to play with a good sound. They have to listen to people. They have to be able to use their tongue and their fingers. They have to be able to play in key signatures and, and recognize dynamics, like all the things that you teach. Then you get into those groups and it's like, okay, let's remember to play with good sound. And then they know what that means. You don't have to try to teach it. Well, I'm going to use you as an example. We okay. were at a staff meeting at your house talk, get, preparing for Martian Man season, and we were talking about uh, one of our f loved percussion instructors who's taking a break for a while. And he said, you know, when I first came here, I went, I'd go to the kids, yada, 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 and they'd go, yada, yada, and we'd, we'd teach right by rote back and forth. But he said, as he worked with you, the percussionists could read because they were learning to read in concert band. Yeah. So he wasn't having to teach by rote. And he was teaching twice as much music because they were reading it, not yeah. learning it by rote, and could work on other things than, okay, that's that's a right arm cue. You got to get that right. That's Swiss Army triplet. You got to get that right. You were able to say, okay, here's what it looks like, and learn how to play because they could read music, not have to be, have it forced down their throats. Yep. And that was a tribute to you, and it was a tribute to him because he recognized that, you know, these kids are good. And that's because the contraband program made them good. Mm -hmm. yep. And the other thing that I think um, I see you do it. I did it. You, you have your year sort of in seasons. There's marching band season. There's contraband goes on all the time, but there's a, con there's contraband seasons. There's jazz season. There's winter guard season. There's winter percussion season. And, you know, I think, 
<coughs> that's the healthy way to do it. Being mindful that the concert band is the constant thread that's going yep. on the entire time during those seasons. I will make a note that I, I a number of years ago, our jazz band season is definitely a jazz band season, but in the fall and in the spring, we do meet once a week for more casual performances. Because I just found, you know, this is not a jazz band episode, and we will have some of those coming up soon, so stay tuned for those. Um, but, like, when you have to swing in jazz band, I don't care what age you're at, it doesn't just happen. It's something that's developmental that you have to work on and be taught how to do it. So I'd much rather kids play 20 jazz band pieces than three. Um, so I found that if we play all year long in a very casual way and then kind of focus more in the jazz season, things are easier. Bass players and drummers are used to hearing each other. Uh, and kids understand, oh, when I see eighth notes, I'm going to articulate it off beat to on beat, off beat to on beat. And, and when I see quarter notes, I'm going to play dot, dot, dot. You know, it's these, these things. So you can, again, you have to keep the balance of your program in check all the time but you can find ways to kind of sneak things to make it a little longer in either direction if you can do it in a healthy way for the kids and for the program if you have a rationale to do it for me it was hey this is the american music jazz band is the american music that we have i want my kids to study it more and be more be more well versed and be more educated in it so we're going to extend it a little bit and i'm going to do it within the schedule that they can that they can do we don't do jazz music in concert band. I almost never try to get my concert band to swing. Um, six, eight is the closest thing that we would do that, that would swing. Um, but the fundamentals all carry through. Well, I agree with you. During Martian season, we, we also did jazz ensemble, which a lot of my colleagues just put on the back shelf till Martian season was over. But what the way we did it is that we worked on rhythm, but we also, I give them a book of about 30 pieces and they we, we'd sight read them and we'd talk about them for a while, knowing that that might be future repertoire during the course of the season, season, the entire year, pardon me, and did it that way. And then at the end of the year, we had a huge jazz concert, but we had been developing repertoire along the way so that we had that repertoire to use at the very end. And we, we'd, we'd, add, we'd usually have a book about 40 to 50 pieces that we would work on during the entire year. Uh, there's one other thing I'd like to point out. Not every schools do this. We did it, and that was we put a great deal of importance on learning musical theater through the. And we had uh, our pit orchestras were always. I conducted the pit orchestra and I managed the the uh, the uh, musical, and we always had a pit orchestra because I found that a lot of my kids loved playing, and we had the opportunity. My kids played in orchestra as well. Once a week, they'd go to orchestra rehearsal. Some of the kids that to play the parts in orchestra that were needed in the wind section and percussion section, but musical theater. And what came out of that is that a lot of my kids, once they went to college and majored in music are now playing in pit orchestras. That's their job. And they, they love it because they love the variety they get and of playing in so many different shows. So that's, that's another option to consider, but it's not the wheel because there are school districts where that is the wheel. The yep. hub was still always contraband. And I, I I know I become nauseating just saying that over and over again, but I think that's something our younger band directors need to know that make concert band the hub of your program and you will be happy and make sure you go and look at other programs and have a vision about what you want your program to look like and understand that that vision will evolve. Like the biggest evolutionary change that's happened to bands right now is COVID. Look at how we've evolved around COVID and how we're going to evolve in the next three or four years. Last <laughs> year was probably one of our better years because our seniors were pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. But in the next two years, we're going to have kids that were without true structural band for, yep. what, two years, I think it is? Yep. And that we're going to have to learn to evolve to get through that and move forward and rebuild our programs. And that goes on with everything. And evolving is not bad it's just what they do and you know i'll, I'll give two quick adages and then i'll be quiet when yep. i first started teaching in 1975 my mentor and my the high school band director who i fed from my middle school said to me band directors make their own problems and he didn't mean that negatively it's he meant it that a band director's vision creates what their problems are and my response to him being the wise guy 20 year old saying is well without problems there'll be no growth but in reality, the problems are what make us grow because right. it makes us sit down and make a decision about what we can do, what we should do, 
and why. And the why is important because we have to justify that to ourselves, to our families, and to our colleagues. And if you and if you start with the why and always make sure that what you're doing feeds that why, then you know you can be happy and healthy and keep that that program going forever, or as long as you can at least. Well, yeah. And I remember I had a methods teacher in, back in the late '60s, early '70s, and she said band directors should never stay in a school district for more than five years. They need to move on. They, they, they just to get too complacent. And I used to argue with her all the time. And I said to her, it's the band director that stays in the same place more than five years who and keeps the program moving forward that has it harder because they, they have to reinvent the wheel and come up with new bags of tricks to keep the children engaged and want to stay in the programs. And yes, there are some band directors that stay at the cocktail party too long and should have left. And there are other band directors that should have stayed longer to keep, keep it going for the kids. I know cocktail party wasn't the right thing to use, but that was an adage my former supervisor used to use all the time. I apologize. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, uh, we, are, we are coming near the end here. I know briefly we want to talk about lessons. Um, in our school, we're able to have contracted services, which are strictly not lessons. They are groups of kids, but it's, it allows for us to bring a professional in and for those kids to go off on their own and work on more specific things that I could teach them as well, but it's just a great way to schedule it and do it so that um, they get some time with a professional on their instrument. Um, the two ways I've done it is, well, actually the only way I've done it is they come in during the band class and then during that class, for example, everybody goes to a sectional for that day. Sometimes it's the same day a week or sometimes if the schedule doesn't work out, it's okay on one, on Mondays, the saxophones are going to be going away on Tuesdays, the clarinets and trumpets are going to go away. And, um, and now, unfortunately with COVID, a lot of kids don't like, they feel like being called, they're being called out when they go to sectional. Um, but if that's part of your culture and, and you can just make it, you know, uh, something that you always do, that, that's been really great. We, we can't do the private lesson thing. I mean, I have probably a handful of kids that I give lessons to throughout the school week, but there just isn't enough time to do, you know, a ton more than that. So give us your, your lesson, lesson push for modern bands. Well, what we did and what we still do in the district that I taught in is that we had pullout lessons for every student who wasn't studying privately. And uh, so we would have group lessons, sometimes homogeneously grouped, sometimes heterogeneously grouped, and they'd come out for a lesson once every eight, seven days of school because of the way the cycle went on the, on the schedule. And the kids would, would uh, come out of an academic class and take a lesson. And, you know, it's a sell, it's a hard sell to the teachers, but um, we use a lot of different situations to describe it. We used to say, well, do you complain when the uh, basketball team leaves early on seventh period, when seventh period comes around or fourth period, whatever, to go to a game? No. I said, well, this is no different than that. Yep. And, and I said, the only difference is that they're learning. They're, they're not going to compete. They're going to learn new concepts with new people. And uh, that worked well for us. Um, and what it did, where, where I'm from there, we were only 45 minutes out of New York City. So there's a plethora of good private teachers in the area so some kids said well i'd rather not do that but i'd like to take private lessons i said okay uh let me meet your private teacher either online or on the phone or in person and we'll talk about how we're going to do things and then i would check in with the private teachers on a regular basis but the the heterogeneous group lessons worked great for us because it for instance one year we were really short on tubas and baritones or euphoniums and i had special lessons for kids who had never played before from that, I got five tuba players and who could read and play and four euphonium players, which filled our ranks and uh, took care of a, a problem where we had one year in, well, three years in a middle school that we weren't getting enough. And um, I always find that there are children in the high school say, boy, I wish I could have played this. And I say, your wish is my command. Let's do it. Yep. And get them in. And even if I got them in the band program for their senior year or even their junior year, <laughs> to me, that was a win-win. That was just one more kid that played an instrument they never played before. We got the experience. For us, we do that. We do that in an intro to band class, you know, so kids can sign up for intro to band, and then they they come in with a you know whatever group, and then their job is to learn to play so they can be in band. So you're right. Like recruiting those kids who have not joined the band but do want to do it is another one of our jobs, and we've had a past episode about that. But that's a that's a really important one too. And I think also the communication with guidance counselors 
And this has to be, I think, another session that we need to talk about, because sometimes guidance counselors put a lot of pressure on kids to say, well, you did ban once. You don't need to do it again in your your junior or senior year. And it's not that's not how ban works. And it, it's an educational process of for the kids, for the parents and the guidance department in getting them on board with what your philosophies are. But I think lessons are paramount. We, we do lessons in elementary school for band and we do element lessons in middle school and we still do lessons in high school. All right, Jeff, we got to wrap this up. All right. Uh, it's been a great talk. Everybody, our next one coming up, I'm really looking forward to. It's sort of a one-of-a-kind um, episode that's going to be coming out next week. So I hope you guys check that out. Again, please share with your friends and uh, keep fighting the good fight. See you later, Jeff. Take care. Have fun. Thank you for listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, if you have the time, we highly recommend the After Sectionals podcast for more great listening. Thank you for listening to the Growing Band Director. See you next week.